Antarctica, the coldest, most forbidding continent on Earth. Since early this century, humans have attempted to explore and exploit this vast frozen wilderness. And with them all this time have been the Huskies. But now, by international decree, Zipper and the other Huskies from Australia's Mawson Station are being deported. For the people in Antarctica who have come to love and rely on these rugged working dogs, it's a very sad moment. Well, I'll tell you where the most emotional was, was just actually sit jumping in the helicopter with a dog and just, just sort of cuddling it and patting it and saying, look, everything's OK, mate, it's calm. You're just coming for a helicopter ride now. And, uh, you know, I just, very, very emotional time here. Yeah. This is the story of the last days in Antarctica of the Mawson Huskies and their uncertain future. Their deportation marks the passing of a remarkable partnership between working dogs and expeditioners in the far south. It's the end of an era. The ancestors of these dogs came to Antarctica when the first Australian base was established. Hardbottle and the other 29 dogs came from Greenland and Labrador in the early 1950s. From the newly established Mawson Station, they helped to explore a vast area of Antarctica. For the next 40 years, their descendants lived on these same dog lines, chained up through the long, dark winters. Temperatures regularly drop below minus 40 degrees, with winds sometimes over 100 knots. The winter before their huskies were to leave forever, knowing that it was their last chance, Dave Pottage and Al Rook pushed for one last dog sled expedition. Zipper and the other Huskies have become pawns in the negotiation of the Madrid Protocol, an international agreement under which all introduced species, except man, must leave. Under these new regulations, their handlers had been directed to stop them breeding. However, a happy accident during winter saw Coco become the mother of three pups, Frosty, Cobber and Misty the last to be born in Antarctica. It was thought that Bundy and the other Mawson Huskies would have to be killed. There was a public outcry the Australian government began to search for a new home where they could be kept together as working teams. Their final expedition is an historic occasion, one of the last dog sled journeys in Antarctica. It will take them over hundreds of kilometres of treacherous sea ice to inspect penguin rookeries along the coastline. Knots in the stomach, butterflies. Am I going to be able to run that far? Are the dogs going to cope? Are they ready? Are the sleds prepared correctly? Have we got everything? Um, yeah, there's a little bit of fear. Well, quite a bit of fear, actually, because it's, uh, it's a long way from base. And with no uh, outside help available, that's a bit scary. Zipper, the lead dog, looks first at Bundy, his mother, and then back around to Bear, the station's king dog. Zipper sees the hand signal of his dogman and turns to carry out his orders. Bear, the heaviest husky of the team, weighing in at nearly 50 kilograms, casts an approving eye over the pack 
as the whole team tastes the freedom of finally being off the chain again. This expedition will be their last contribution as working dogs in Antarctica. On this last journey, the two teams of nine dogs and four men hope to reach the penguin rookery at Clower Point, a round trip of 600 kilometers. Antarctica is a huge ice-covered landmass. In winter, the surface of the sea around it freezes over. In spring, although the sea ice has started to melt, the teams can travel with caution along the coast to visit the emperor penguin rookeries. They camp on rocky islands in case the ice should suddenly break out. With the inevitable visits, their journey could take a month or more. They just love the work and they just get in a steady stride and um, you can see them just thoroughly enjoy it. All the tails are up and uh, you know, they look around at you, tongues hanging out and almost a smile on their face. Total freedom, absolutely total freedom. Not a care in the world except running and running and running and just seeing the most magnificent scenery on foot. The bonding with the dogs, it happens quickly and almost unnoticeably, but after a few days, you just, you really get to know what the dogs are up to, how they're running, which personality is going to cause trouble, and yeah, you just slot in with them. At first, the weather is unexpectedly cold. In the wind, the temperature stays below minus 40 degrees the entire day. The tents are a welcome haven for the dogmen. Journal entry, Friday the 18th. This is the furthest west I've been in what magnificent country. Islands and icebergs surround us as the track becomes rougher. No problems with the dogs, they are running strongly. The faith Al and Dave have in their sledge dogs is a world apart from how the first British expedition viewed such means of transport. Captain Scott's expedition failed to see the advantages of huskies as working dogs. Being English, they treated them more like pets. Osman is here asking for his dinner. And Chris was the handsomest member of the bank. He favoured the use of Manchurian ponies over huskies in his attempt to be the first to the South Pole. Captain Scott always kept a watchful eye on the transport animals, and he often had a friendly word for the ponies. It was a bad mistake as the strongest pony only made it a quarter of the total distance. Scott and his four companions were forced to begin the brutal and punishing task of man-hauling for 1,500 kilometers. They lost the race and died of exhaustion and hunger while trying to return. On the other hand, Roald Amundsen was successful because he knew how to get the most from his Greenland Huskies. Careful preparations and the endurance of our dogs turned our trip into a picnic. Today, Amundsen's tactics would be considered ruthless. He started his expedition with 52 dogs, but only 11 of them returned. His strategy was to kill them for food. We carried out the work of slaughtering the superfluous dogs. We found that dog cutlets made a delicious dinner. These were not fried, as we had neither frying pan nor butter. We found it quicker to boil them. Amundsen insisted on strict control of his husky teams, a tradition which continues with Alan Dave. Without human intervention, the packed nature of the husky would lead to a clear-cut hierarchy. One king dog would call the tune. Arnie, the tough white husky, and Bear, the biggest of them all, are both older dogs competing with each other for the throne. This is why Arnie looks like he's um, come out of the Second World War with a big scar on his nose and uh, another one under his eye. You know, he's, he's battle-worn, I mean. Well, he's sort of stood his territory and um, he's sort of one of the top dogs. 
Suddenly, just an onion bear sort of just got into it, and the next minute, the whole nine dogs are all into it. I think, oh, God, someone's going to get killed here for sure. Get out of here! Then we found out the bear was on the bottom, and he was copping it all. Bear squeals with pain, which incites the other dogs to turn on him, even though he is one of the king dogs. Fighting is in the nature of the breed, but the dog handlers must stop them from getting out of hand. For over 3,000 years, the Inuit people of the Arctic bred a hardy working dog that has been essential to their survival. The Mawson Husky bloodline comes from the dogs bred by these people in Greenland and Labrador. There is some controversy about whether they crossbred their dogs with wolves. In fact, they didn't. The Husky is a separate breed of dog that does have elements of wild pack behavior and yet will not attack humans. The Inuit dog was traditionally fed seal meat and had to fend for itself for part of the year and so became a good hunter, a trade that invariably causes problems for the dog handlers in the Antarctic. Well, the seals uh, have come out fairly early. They come out in early September. And they start pupping about early October, so there are quite a few seals. And we've got to, of course, be careful with that. We make every effort to um, uh, you know, keep the dogs well away from the wildlife. In spring, the seals haul out through tide cracks to pup. They must wait on the ice till the pups are old enough to swim. I mean, they don't know the right and wrong of not uh, attacking wildlife, so we've got to sort of instill into them that that's not what we like to see. And the older dogs tend to, uh, you know, with a solid speaking to, um, you know, they, they respond very well to you. The younger pups are still la lapping around and, you know, Lolo, get in there for crying out loud, you know, and um, he won't listen to the word. All he can see is a penguin in the distance and he just wants to go and that, that's his dinner for the night. And it, will, it takes a while to control them and and tell them, well, look, you know, that's not, not the done thing down here, mate. After 14 days on the trail, the teams finally reach Clower Point, near the furthest penguin rookery. It's been a tradition for the Mawson Huskies to make this 300-kilometre run in spring. The teams are among the last 50 Huskies on the entire continent, and their journey marks the end of a 100-year partnership in Antarctica. The overall philosophy of arriving in camp is to settle your dogs down and then go and put the, your night span trace out for your nine dogs. And then get your dogs on as quickly as possible onto that span. That way that the dogs know that the end of the day has come. Thank you very much for your run today. But that's by taking their harnesses off, giving them a pat, and then the dogs are settled. The staple diet of the dogs on the trail is the pemmican block. This traditional sled dog food is a highly compressed mixture of meat, vegetables and vitamins. Friday, 2nd of October at Clower Point. In the evening, the weather starts to close in. Maybe we're in for a blow. Saturday, 3rd October, Clower Point. We are blizzed in. Visibility drops to 50 metres and there is no hope of going anywhere. Al and Dave and their dogs are at the mercy of a full Antarctic blizzard. 
trapped by the elements. They're in a similar position to many who have come before. On Ernest Shackleton's ill-fated attempt to cross the Antarctic continent in 1914, his ship became trapped in the ice. The men and the 70 Huskies that were to have pulled them to glory waited helplessly for the ice to break up and set them free. How dreary the frozen captivity of our life would have been without the dogs. After nearly a year, their ship finally broke up. The dogs were crucial in dragging supplies across broken ice towards the open sea. Then they were finally sacrificed to provide food for the survival of the party. Around 1600, I venture out to check the tents and feed the dogs. All is well with the fur balls. No drift build up around them. Not very pleasant outside. because um, in a matter of a couple of hours you can actually get you know, two or three feet of snow and then, you know, if a dog's buried by the chain, he can actually be suffocated. Sunday, the 4th of October, we are still blizzed in. Dogs are okay. There's only a little bit of chain buried and the whiteout conditions prevail, so there's no hope of travelling. On Tuesday the 6th, we eventually got out. After five nights pinned down in the tents, the teams are finally able to move again. Now the main purpose of the expedition can be achieved. There are only 30 emperor penguin rookeries in the world, and checking on them is vital to the preservation of this unique species. Al and Dave count the chicks and record the adults' direction of movement to find out where they're feeding. Emperors, who breed in winter, differ from all other penguins. The egg is actually incubated by the males. Then in the spring, the chicks are nurtured by both parents until feathers replace their fluffy grey down. enter Mawson Harbour for the last time, having covered 630 kilometres. The Cloa expedition has taken 33 days to complete. For eight of these, they were pinned down by blizzards. Coming into Mawson was just fantastic. Yeah, seeing the lights and the buildings and people all the smells and mouths cooking, <laughs> fresh food, more beer. Yeah, a really good uh, finish to a, a fantastic trip. After Zipper, Arnie and their teams leave, travel to the distant penguin rookeries will have to be done by vehicle. Alan Dave at diesel-powered Hagland is a less appealing alternative. Safety is also a consideration. 
undoubtedly dog sledding over sea ice is the safest form of travel because they'll uh, just run along and suddenly balk and you'll know, hello, there's um, some danger ahead. Whereas haggling, you can quite easily come to a tide crack that has been covered over and it could, it could be three to four foot wide and bang, the haggler can go in. The Huskies were kept at Mawson Station after they were removed from other bases because there were several accidents like this. Luckily, there have been no injuries when the vehicles have broken through the ice. The Aurora Australis steams south on its mission to resupply the base and remove the Huskies. A new home has been proposed for them in America. Dog sled operators in Minnesota were thought to offer the best home for Coco, her three pups, and the other huskies. Probably the most qualified person to drive this buggy if she There is also disagreement at the station about whether the Australian government should be removing the dogs at all. All avenues of appeal by those opposed to the dog's departure come to nothing. Al and Dave are chosen to run the dogs to meet the ship at the ice edge. They will then accompany them all the way to America. Well, I've never been to Minnesota, but from what I've heard, what I've read, and what I've been told, and the contact I've had with the people running the operations in Minnesota, I think they'll go very well. I think they have a lot more work than they get here, and I think they're gonna be a lot happier because they're not gonna be living in such harsh conditions. It is extremely harsh, and people just aren't aware how harsh it is. They park up into a blitz, 50, 60 knots quite often. They may sit on the dog line for nearly a month. They spend more time on the chain than off. It's a sad fact of life. The day has come when the Huskies must finally go. Their run to the ship over 70 kilometres across sea ice will be very hard because of the fresh snow that fell during the blizzard. It's a very sad day. In fact, I think I'd go so far as to say it's a tragic day. Uh, it's the end of an era here at Mawson. that actually and not have people seeing you crying because it's like just leaving the harbour for the last time on the dogs and there's Mawson Station in the background and everybody waving and you're on the last the last dog ride out of, out of town never to be repeated ever that's pretty emotional stuff three pumps are flown to the ship after being sedated. Meanwhile, the teams are having a difficult time navigating a path through the fresh snow drifts. Well, how do you say this? I know it's a bit longer, one and a half kilometres out. Oh, it's easier, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can and then the penguins, the Within penguins. sort of three or four kilometres, we hit very, very soft snow between Mawson and the ship. Very hard going. Um, it meant that uh, Alan and myself were just uh, virtually walking and jogging beside the sled, as the dogs were called it. After struggling nearly 50 kilometres, the two dog teams come across the Haglands that are returning from the ship. The driver's worn of broken ice that has to be crossed. It's getting very late, so an alternative plan is made. Well, as far as this is the ground party. Martin here, uh, just have a look at the situation here with the Satugi, it's pretty rough. Uh, therefore, we're going to fly the dogs to the ship just at the last 10k. 
Inspector, do you know that everyone on the ship there that we have dogs with you in a few minutes? Yeah, Roger, Martin, OK. Well, that was probably the saddest part of it all because um, it happened so quick. Martin said, right, OK, well, let's take them in helicopter. So uh, we just put the back seat up, grabbed uh, Gilmore and Oscar, the first two dogs we grabbed from the front of our team, just walked straight up, jumped in the helicopter. Yeah, Roger, Martin, OK. I suppose 30 seconds the helicopter was lifting off and flying towards the ship. Well, it's, it's all over and um, this is the dogs leaving in Arctic and I, was, I just had absolute tears in my eyes. life is like here. I can't tell you what it's going to be like in Minnesota. I believe that it's going to be a lot better on such a uh, severe climate. But... Huskies have traditionally travelled well by ship. The journey ahead by plane and road may not be so easy. After three weeks at sea, they arrive in Hobart. The Huskies have to pass through Australia's strict quarantine. Bear and the others were sealed up for quarantine, not to be let out until they reached Los Angeles. To get to Los Angeles, the dogs are loaded into the hold of a jumbo jet. Los Angeles, we were first off the plane, which was good, and uh, one of the ground staff there at Los Angeles took us straight down to the um, tarmac area. Um, we'll, we'll do four dogs at a time. We'll take them out, run them around so they can um, urinate and have a good drink of water. Then we'll um, uh, let them get a little bit of exercise, and then we'll put them in, then we'll do another four. I was a bit upset at the um, at the transport containers that the dogs were expected to travel in and um, I thought heavens above you know we've got two and a half days of this and um, you know, I was sort of very apprehensive right from the word go. On reaching Ely the first stop is the Minnesota Outward Bound School where 17 dogs are left. Coco's team continues on to Paul Shirky's Wintergreen Lodge on the other side of the lake. Since leaving Mawson, the 22 Australian Huskies have been on the road for four weeks. They've travelled 20,000 kilometres to the other side of the world. I bet you're feeling pretty fried. Uh, it's yeah. all right, mate. It's been a long trip. This dog look good? Yeah. Yeah, uh, let's get him out of here. All right, I'm interested to meet him. Yeah. Hey, Paul? Yeah. Yeah. All right. What do we got here? Oh, well, you ready? Yeah. The, uh, the grand entry is winter beans. Yeah, they can't even get out of the haircut. Oh, hi, Coco. Hey, it's the bitch, uh, the mother of the pups. Yeah. Coco, welcome. This is the other female, this is Jetta. Hey, pack little dog. We have a lot of friends here. Forty of them down there waiting to see us. They're all in good condition. Hi there, Oscar. Beautiful color. Come on, Oscar. 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 Come on,
Come on, Zipper. Mash it up. Good boys. Good boys. Mash. Good boys. Mash it up. Uh, within five or six hours, we took a team out uh, to run down the road and just to, just to let them um, experience the snow and they just absolutely fit in him, almost as if they'd been here all their lives. At both lodges here in Minnesota, the dogs get to live out of the wind for the first time. There are plenty of staff to give them affection. The 17 Mawson Huskies at Outward Bound share the yard with 30 other dogs. They will work together as teams, taking groups on winter camping expeditions. After two weeks, the Huskies seem to be settling in at both camps without any sickness. In fact, Dave and Al are surprised at how well they're thriving. They're clearly the strongest breed dogs I've ever encountered, and quite likely the strongest ones that have ever, have ever set foot in the United States. So uh, for, for whatever that's worth, we, we, feel, we feel very honored to have them here. And they, you know, we're, at this point, we're, we're, we're fairly certain that these, that the Boston Huskies here at Wintergreen Lodge will be among the dogs that will be used on our, on our expedition to the North Pole we come next May. Uh, clearly, they have, they have what it takes to do the job. It's absolutely superb. I mean, the beautiful sounds and um, lakes and uh, the trees and uh, we can, this is like the sea ice down south, but then we go up into the trails and uh, uh, camp and uh, absolutely marvellous experience here. They bunch up together close to the main trace and with the um, toboggan sleds, I'm just amazed at how they handle the, the conditions leaping over logs. Yeah, it's pretty exciting stuff, running um, dogs through the trails. And considering these dogs have never seen trees or trails before, they're just handling it so well. Beautiful. Some people claim that if the dogs had to go, why not let them die out in Antarctica? Well, I totally disagree with that. Why let them die out and uh, make them ghosts when here the breed actually does live on? And it's not really an ending. It's just a continuation of the story. Three months later, reassured that their dogs were in good hands, Al and Dave returned to Australia. On the 16th of May, six months after leaving Antarctica, Coco, Jeddah, Merlin, Oscar and Guhor reached the North Pole with Paul Shirky and his team. They have earned a place for themselves in many future Arctic adventures. <laughs>